progress towards something that is slightly more complex and more complicated. I hope that no one will leave this session disappointed and everyone will learn something and no one will get lost. Um, I think that like this, uh, the script that we will end up with uh, after this, uh, this seminar, uh, I'll send it to U of T uh, coders or, and I'm sure that you can download it afterwards. I will clean it a little bit because I think that through the seminar I, I will create some, some havoc. And all I also wanted to say regarding the Python and R, like, you know, Python is amazing and I like it very much. What is brilliant about R is that R was made by statisticians for statisticians. And to be honest, there are not that many things that go that well together as R and, and statistics. Like it's like um, cookies and milk, like it, <laughs> it goes, <laughs> goes over, goes together very well. So let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's talk about what we're going to learn today. I was uh, I was thinking that we will start with some basic data uh, data types in R, but I think like we can completely avoid these two, and uh, we will start with calculation of uh, some basic statistical objects like mean, median, and so on. We will go to the histograms and uh, distributions, and then we will cover correlations, uh, hypothesis testing, and finally we will uh, play a little bit with. Uh, linear and uh, other regression models. So I created some sort of cheat sheet for myself, so I won't forget what I wanted to tell you and what I wanted to show you. So uh, start go. Number one is like, so we'll try to uh, load the data set. I promise that all the data we will use are generic data that are available uh, in R without need to install any package. And one of such uh, data sets is empty cars data set. Into get to that you don't need to do anything else just type data empty cars and you will have an uh, empty cars data set loaded we can take a look on what empty cars consist of and uh, it has an 11 columns uh, I don't know how many rows it contains a mileage that is number of miles per gallon for car and you know, actually what we can do we can take a look on the head so MPG is mileage, C cell is number of cylinders, displacement, I, I'm not much into cars, I don't really know what most of these things mean, but uh, we won't use all the columns, just uh, some of them. Uh, and uh, so that's about it when it comes to the description of the data set. One very cool thing that I believe it's always worth to do before you do anything is like take a look on uh, summary of the, of the data set. So if you type summary in R, uh, this function will give you some sort of like crude description, statistical description of individual columns consisting of minimum value, maximum value, which are here, first quartile, third quartile, median, which is the second quartile, and mean. Notice one thing that uh, if I'll go back to the head, you know, A and M is a binary variable that contains only zeros and ones, which means zeros are manual transmission, automatic transmission and one encodes manual transition. If I do something like that, that so I'll convert empty cars AM into factors. So now it's just a simple numeric variable. Yeah. Which one? The line that you're typing. Can it be a bit higher? The this line? I don't think so. It's always on the bottom of our studio. I hope it's not a big deal. Sorry for that, guys. So what I just did is I instructed R that variable stored in a column AM is supposed to be treated as a categorical variable. And if I'll look at the AM, that means transmission column, it just added something that is called levels. So it recognizes it as a categorical variable can, that can have only two values. One is zero, one is one. And now you repeat the same thing with the summary. So I again look on the summary of the data set. What, what happens is AM out of the sudden doesn't have a median, mean, and the quartiles. It just has a two values that represent how many zeros there are in that column and how many ones. So this is very, very handy. Even, even it may not seem that handy at this moment, it's very handy. Now, 
So let's calculate some very basic statistical objects. So statistical objects like mean and median are um, pre-implemented in R. You don't have to build a function for uh, calculating them. They are like simply they are there. So if we want to calculate, let's say, mean mileage across the data set we just use. Mean, and here we go. We can do the same thing with median. We can even calculate standard deviation and so on. Very easy, right? Now, what I wanted to point out here is that imagine we have a following question. How many cars can do more than 25 miles per gallon? So one way is like do this and then calculate sum of true and false. But if you in R, if you do mean or Boolean variable or logical vector, you will instantly get fraction of truth in the in the in the in the logical vector. Also a very handy feature. Now imagine that we want to calculate means across all the columns in our empty cars data set. So again in R is super simple because all we have to do is to type call means. Uh, of course, uh, because I set it up some of the variables, particularly AM to be factor, it has a problem to, to calculate mean for that, but it will limit ourselves to mileage, uh, horsepower, and uh, displacement. Should work. Now, imagine that you want to calculate medians exactly the same way. Well, there is no such a function as uh, call median. So we have to simply do this. We take empty cars and we use iterator that is uh, in R called apply. Apply will apply certain function across all the rows or all the columns. And whether it's going to be rows or columns is decided based on this argument here. So if this would be one. You only, you only wanted MPG, HP. Yes, because some of the uh, columns, particularly AM column, has been transformed to factor, and it would fail to calculate the uh, mean of, of factor. Uh, I did it just somewhere up. It's not in the in the script. Sorry. If you look here. Uh, Again. I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Then get it to work. I'm sure. Or I think so at least. <laughs> so I can do it once again. See? It works. Now, I'll go back to the apply. So apply is iterator, which means that you can instruct R to apply certain function across rows or across columns. In this case, we will apply function median across columns. Here we go. Very simple. If we will use mean, we should obtain exactly the same numbers. So let's go here. Carp 2.81, 2.81, cylinders 6.18, 6.18. So you see it's, it's correct. What if we can, we want to go with some exotic function that is not even implemented in R. So median is implemented, uh, same as mean is. But what about geometric mean? Well, it's actually not that hard because what we can do, we can again use apply, but this time we have to write our function, the geometric mean function ourselves. So one like very tricky way or like maybe hack hackish way of how to uh, calculate geometric mean is to first logarithmize x to the, the, the variable, then calculate its arithmetic mean, and then use exponent like that. So this way you obtain geometric mean. Uh, so you yeah, that's one way how to do it. Not very recommended though, you can actually do it and more safer way is to do something like that. You know, one thing that I personally miss in R is lambda function as in Python. Something that you can try to define and then forget about it. So here there's no lambda function so you can mimic the behavior of lambda function by coming with some, some dummy function f 
define it and then use it in a pie like that. But uh, I don't think uh, it's a big deal to use that. Like, I think it's okay. Exactly. This is exactly how you can write the, the function. You know, uh, as I said, uh, it's not like a lambda function. There are some some noticeable differences, which I myself I'm not aware of all of them. But uh, you you can write you can type define the function right inside the apply. It's it's quite common. Okay, so imagine other scenario. Imagine that you want to know the means of mileage of cars, but across subsets. So let's say we want to calculate means of uh, mean of mileage of cars with automatic transmission and mean of uh, mileage of cars with uh, manual transmission. So R is equipped by like very uh, handy function by that allows you to do, pardon me, do this. So first is the quantity that we are going to calculate mean of in this case, mileage, and then we need some factor uh, by which we will split the, this vector into two or more groups. So we can use uh, uh, AM. We have to convert it. We don't have to, in fact, convert it to factor, but it's uh, more rigid. And here we define the function we want to uh, apply. So here we go. This is the mean mileage of cars with AM equal to zero. So that means manual transmission. And this is, pardon me, automatic transmission. <laughs> this is the mean mileage of cars with uh, manual one. But we can we can calculate actually median or any custom function that we enter here. It can be geometric mean, in fact. Um, it doesn't have to be only for two factors. If you use, for example, number of cylinders, we will get the numbers for cylinders and on the top of that if you are interested in so again mean across the cars with automatic and uh, manual transmission and if you want to know the difference you just use this and you have the difference right away so these are the basic statistical objects and i think that section wouldn't be complete without telling you how to calculate quantiles so if you use uh Quantile function, per default, it will tell you what is the zero percentile, so the lowest value in the in the in the in the vector. Twenty-fifth percentile that means first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum value. But in fact, what you can do, you can ask for any percentile you want. Fifth, ninety-fifth. You can actually ask for. A, Set of percentiles. Right, so that is the, the section of basic uh, statistical objects. Now let's go to histograms, which are also very, very um, uh, easily to plot in, uh, in R. I'll start with something very simple. So this is the histogram of mileage. And notice one thing, here on the y-axis, we see frequency. So that is the number of observation for that beam and another beam, another beam, another beam. What we can do, and sometimes we don't care much about the actual frequency, we want to know the fraction or the probability. So you see how the numbers change. All of a sudden, we don't have a frequency. We have a probability of, if we would randomly pick one car from our data set, so the probability that its mileage will be between 10, 10 and 50 miles per gallon is somewhere here. The, the, in, if we would integrate curve underneath, it should be one. So sometimes what happens is that we want to have a histogram data, but we don't care much about the plot. So what we can do, we can just say we don't care about the plot and we obtain all the all the values that are needed to reconstruct it in case we want. I don't know how about you, but I consider these default uh, plots of R quite ugly. They are certainly not publication ready. So uh, sometimes would, in, in this case, you can ask for data and then you can use some much more like visually attractive uh, functions 
for drawing and plotting, like ggplot provides plenty of them, uh, to plot much more beautiful histogram. Well, but uh, that is not important. Another cool function in R is the empirical cumulative distribution function. So for those of you who may not know what empirical cumulative distribution function is, pretty much it says uh, how likely it is that car from our data set will have a mileage less than given value x. So I'll demonstrate it here. So let's type ECDF of empty cars mileage, and it will be our mileage ECDF. Now, I want you to notice one thing. So the class of my uh, MPG ECDF is something like that, but I don't know if you notice one thing. As I was typing that, See, R automatically added brackets here. This is because what we created is function. So ECDF is a constructor for function. Now, what is this function good for? I'll show you right now. So let's say I type 25 here. It tells me what's the fraction of the cars in the data set that has a mileage less than that value. But the cool thing about it is that it's actually really the cumulative distribution function. It's, it's a different than asking how many of samples in our observation are less. It can cover absolutely any value I can put here. Like um, I don't think I can explain it any better than that. But what I can do is I can, pardon me, this was supposed to be here. I can plot ECDF function. So. Here, this is the cumulative distribution function. So this is the mileage, and this uh, qu quantity on the y-axis tells us what's the fraction of cars in our data sets that, that, that are below this value x. So this is the empirical cumulative distribution function. Now, distributions. So I think like the most common distribution that we all working with here and there more or less often is a normal distribution. So if you want to generate some values from normal distribution in R, it's super easy. We just go with R norm and we ask for a certain number of, uh, of values. Now, without telling you, uh, per default, R norm, R norm is uh, generating uh, data from normal distribution with mean equal to zero and standard, de um, standard deviation equal to one. Now, if you want to have a data with normal distribution with certain different parameters, it's very easy. You just instruct function to, to give you uh, some some. You just you just instruct the the, the function of like what, what? yes yeah exactly. <laughs> this is what I was just up to. So if we plot x like that. We can plot the histogram. Pardon me. So you see it's quite normal-ish. Um, now, but here and there, we don't care about actually the numbers, or we don't want to generate numbers from a certain uh, distribution. We care more about the density function of the distribution, which means that we are asking like, you know, what is the value of the distribution in point 0.1, point 0.5, let's say. So we want to have number, I think, so we want to have number around 0 0.35 or something like that. Does it make sense? So, so that is covered in D norm. So if you use exactly same parameters, first parameter of the D norm is the X. So we should get mm -hmm. So, once again, so what I did is I asked like, what is the value of the density function of R 
distribution or normal distribution in a point x equal to 1.5 and it told me that it's 0 0.48 and looking at this uh, histogram it seems about right this is the density function sometimes we are actually um, interested in cumulative density function so this is Mm. This is the norm. So let's say we want to know. So what Kino told us or says is like what fraction of the population is below this value, zero point five cumulative density, right? So if I type here 2.0, what should I obtain? Come on. So we have a normal distribution with mean equal to two, and I'm asking for what is the cumulative uh, probability at that point? It should supposed to be one half, right? And third Debbie, third variant of the of the of this uh, function is Q norm that gives us a quantile. So if I use this, what should I obtain? Yes, exactly. Um, what happened? Oh, pardon me. Oh, sorry, if I ask for one half, I should obtain 2.0. That is what I wanted to say. Pardon me. Yes. It, it, it's not limited to quantiles, right? It, it can be, it can be this. Help in the exact number. Uh, in absolutely, in total analogy to that, R is equipped by other distributions. For example, uniform distribution can be generated using R unif, where first variable, first input says how many I want, then. Uh, I can say like, what is the lower interval, uh, lower limit and upper limit, and I obtain pretty much uh, with, with great ease uh, any 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 distribution I want. So that, that's it for the distributions. Let's go to correlations. Now, I'm sure any of you at least once tried to calculate some correlation. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Well, a lot of people calculate correlations and uh, you know, they not always know what calculation they are creating. So imagine you want to know how uh, mileage and horsepower are correlated. So we can use uh, function core in R and we are happy because we have some relatively result that is quite anticipated. Greater the horsepower, more powerful the car. The lower the mileage, the, the, the car cannot go that far with, the, with one, one gallon. But, uh, well, somewhere in behind this, there are like, there is something that is called like method or, in fact, like the function core in R hides three different methods for calculating correlation. So per, per default, it uses um, Pearson correlation coefficient. So that measures linear, linear, linearity of the association. So this is what we obtain. But there is also Spearman correlation coefficient that rather measures the correlation or linear, linearity of association of the ranks. So that practically means monotonicity. It doesn't care whether association of one another is linear. It just wants to know whether it's monotonic. And the third one, or third one is called candle correlation, which in this case would be like if I would order cards by mileage, and then I would observe, then, then I would count all the pairs where one car has a greater mileage than another, does it hold that it has a lower horsepower than the other? And if so, that power would be considered, or vice versa, the horsepower should be greater, will be considered concordant. And if not, then it's disconcorded. And Kendall simply says how many pairs of all possible pairs are concordant. So that's that's Kendall. Um, so it's good to know that when you, when you use core, you use very particular type of correlation, which, which, which is called Pearson correlation, and uh, there are some others. So 
that's uh, that's one thing. Now, I think like in statistics, numbers should be always accompanied by some graphics. You know, and uh, in this case, when it comes to correlations, uh, one way how to do that is. Um, but, uh, before I go to graphics is one thing that sometimes you want to calculate correlation between more than one column. So let's say we'll go with uh, more than one pair of columns. We want to see correlation of mileage, horsepower, but also displacement. So you see how easy it is in R, like you get correlation metrics right away. Uh, and now, because I said it already, I want to have some visualization of the very same result, I can do it like that. Uh, so again, it's probably not publication ready plot, but it's very good to uh, check whether the numbers we have here really make sense. Uh, and for those of you who ever used pandas in, uh, in Python, you know that pandas has also similar option you can create this panel plot, but on the top of that, there are also histograms here in these diagonals. Uh, if you want to have that, uh, it's actually very, very uh, easy way how to do it is that if you go, I don't know if I told you, or I think you may know that if you type question mark and then the name of the function, it will give you help for the function. So description of the, what the function does, what are the inputs that are expected, description of the outputs and so on. And there are also some examples of how you can use the function. And in case of pairs, what I found is that somewhere here you will find one very hefty function that is called panel hist. Oops. And if you put it here, you run that function, so R knows about it, and you repeat the same command You will obtain the same thing. <laughs> Although, so I will I will explain it. So, uh, pairs function is doing following thing. It takes the columns and depicts them against each other, and it also have a one slot for any function that that produces some visual output. And it, you need to input it into a, a variable called diag panel, diagonal panel, exactly. So, and like, if you don't want to think too much about how to create a function that will generate histograms for diagonal panel, you can just go to help of pairs, and in help of every R function contains some examples of how it can be used. Coincidentally, and it's very pleasant coincidence. Examples for use of pairs function contains definition of this function, which if you copy and paste into your code, and then you use it as for input for diagonal panel, it will simply always generate for you uh, histograms. Well, if you just write it in the code, it will be written in the code, but you have to you have to execute the piece of code. So it's the same as in Python. Well, executing pairs, that line that has pairs function that won't, won't execute the panel that is in it? Yeah, if, 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 the, if the function will be copy pasted here, and I would never, never put it into a console, like the R would never know that such function exists, right? I hope it makes sense. Uh, sometimes, more often than not, in fact, uh, in biology or psychology and so on, we are not satisfied with uh, plain correlation. We also want to know its statistical significance. So, R, for default, or like base of base R, contains function core test that if you if you insert two variables, it will calculate. Uh, not only the effect size, that means correlation, but it also calculates p-value for you. And 
what I want to highlight is if we store the output of core test, core test in a CT variable and we ask for the class of the CT, we'll find that it's H test. H test class or object of the class H test are outputs of most, not all of them, but most statistical test testing functions that R is equipped with. And uh, it's a very, very uh, cool thing because it has a standard standardized um, um, properties. So any H test object contains statistics, parameter, p-value, and so on. Some of them may be missing or uh, in some particular tests, but p-value and statistics are always there. So you can really count on it. You don't have to search, you don't have to inspect outputs of these functions very much. Once you get to used to the fact that all of them are of H test object and you learn how to work with them, uh, you will find it very, very uh, convenient. Um, so in case you want to know what is the p-value and you don't care about anything else, you can just call CT and p-value and here you go, this is the p-value. Um, all the relationships between columns, I think this was covered um, already in the in the pairs, so I think I can skip it. Um, okay, and here comes the confusing thing, at least for me. So, when I was thinking about what I'm gonna uh, talk about today, I was thinking like, I should tell you something that no one told me and I wish someone would tell me <laughs> when I was running R. And one of those things is that uh, core function has very peculiar way how it handles uh, missing values. So I know if you noticed that, but in the description of core function, you will find like something that is called use. And of course, because uh, uh, we all are always busy and in a hurry, we just don't even read it. And, like, when it works, it works. And when it doesn't work, then we may start to dig into it. So what use means? I had to really write it here because uh, otherwise I would forget, <laughs> most likely. So imagine, Normally, empty cars uh, data set has no missing values, but I will create some. So if you want to enter any data set that you currently work with right away to do any adjustment, not to fabricate your results, just to do <laughs> adjustment in data, what you can do, you can use fix function. And let's say we will add some missing values here and there. So maybe here will be one missing value. I'll also add it here. Um, and I'll add one here, Honda Civic. Okay, Honda. And that may be enough. You don't even have to save it, you just close it and you will probably stay there. Or you can check it. Make sure this runs. You see, they are, they are there. And now I'll go one by one and I'll show you what's going to happen. So if I'll calculate a correlation between mileage, horsepower, and uh, I don't even know what this is, but it can be, Wait, let me take a look what this is. Okay, so it's a weight of the car. Uh, and I say I want to use everything, it will throw nuns. This is because any nun in the, in the, any of the columns will propagate through the all calculations and it will return none. So it's very strict uh, setup. If I use core function again, but using all observations, I won't even get the nuns. <laughs> I'll just get error, that's all. So it's even more strict. So any none, any, any missing value in the, in the data will produce error, end of story. You know, if you think about it, from statistic perspective, you may say, well, what's the point? But from the programmatic programmatic perspective, it's a big difference whether you obtain none and that none will, will propagate further down your codes versus getting error, which you can catch without much of the of the, of the need. So uh, without much of an effort. So these are the stricter versions. Now, then you have a complete observations, which means any row with none will be ignored and all nuns will result in error. So let's see what's going to happen. So you see it calculated the, the, the values quite nicely. Th that means that it removed 
every row in the empty cars data set that contain at least one num. It doesn't matter where it is. It may not, but it has to be in one of the three columns that we are, we are using here. Uh, in case we will have a column that contains only missing values, in this case, it will, it will result in error. Very similar behavior will be obtained by not or complete, except it won't throw an error, it will throw an A, like missing value, in case one of the three columns will complete only missing values. It's uh, very similar to first two. And now, probably the most confusing one is the pairwise complete observations. So what it does, so as I said, the previous two, if detected any num anywhere in the, these three columns, it removed the wall line. Well, pairwise complete observation will behave differently. If one column will contain missing value, but other two not, it will include these two values in computation of pairwise correlation. That, however, means one thing, that obtained correlations may be based on different number of, of obtained correlation may be <laughs> based on different number of observations. So if building any statistical test that assesses uh, significance of these values, you have to take that into consideration that each of these correlation in the matrix, resulting matrix, could have been based on different number of observations. Now, and, and you will be surprised, it, it can make a big difference. <laughs> All right, so there were the correlations, and now uh, comes the hypothesis testing. So, you know, is someone, is, is there anyone who thinks that, you know, I, I don't know what hypothesis testing means and I would, I would need more explanation on that. So probably, the, my way of thinking about it is that in, in statistics, pretty much everything we do is we are always testing association of something with something. And when we measure associations, we obtain on some numbers. But to know whether these numbers really are produced by chance or they are really indication of some, some serious significant effect that is worth of scientific attention, we need to conduct what is called hypothesis testing. So we are testing whether obtained data support some alternative hypothesis or not. And we are always comparing it with something that is called null hypothesis, which is data are produced by chance. I hope it makes sense. Now, which one, or do you know any statistical test? Any, just name one, please, if you know. T-test. T-test, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's written here, so that's why you are. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize that. Okay, so like, and do you know what are the assumptions of T-test? Yeah, uh, exactly. So, exactly. Uh, and it's a good thing that, that you know it, because many people don't know that. <laughs> And many, many people use uh, t-test and they don't even think about like where the data that they, they use are normally distributed or not, whether some other assumptions are violated or not, or even if they use some other tests, then, then there are a lot of assumptions. And, and um, so, okay, I won't talk too much, but the point is that if you use t-test, you have to check whether your data are normally distributed. So number one thing in hypothesis testing, check whether assumptions hold. And when the assumption is normality, Check it. How to check uh, uh, normality of data? There is a built-in test called Shapiro test. So we will, in particular, ask whether mile, miles per gallon are normally distributed. And here comes the catch. So we obtain p-value that is 0 0.16. And you may think, OK, so I don't know what does it mean. Is it significant or not? Well, Shapiro world normality test is, in fact, kind of a misnomer. Is not really testing normality, it's really testing deviation from normality. That means that if you will have a p-value 0.99, you actually can sleep well because it means that your data are very likely normally distributed. If you have a p-value that is very low, it means that, so let me backtrack, the zero hypothesis here is that the normality distribution is violated, uh, vice versa, it's not violated. So if you have p-value 0.05, it means that there is a 5% chance at most that the data are not normal. In practice, in statistical rigor expects you to, re to not use any parametric tests if Shapiro test will give you p-value less or equal 
So if there is 10% chance that normality is violated, you shouldn't be using t-test, you shouldn't be using ANOVA, and anything that is uh, assuming normality. Well, of course, it's a magic number. 0 0.1 is not any better than 0 0.09, but generally there is some, uh, some, uh, some agreement on that. Uh, so this is the Shapiro test. So the value is over 0.1? Below, below 0 0.1, yeah. As, so you see, I wanted to, to make it clear, I probably I only confused it. So as I said, it's kind of a misnomer. It's not testing whether we are normal, whether distribution of the underlying data are normal. It's really te testing whether it's deviated from normality. So low p-values means we cannot, we, we can reject null hypothesis. And null hypothesis here is that uh, data are normally distributed. So low p-values with Shapiro test, bad. High p-values with Shapiro test, good. Okay. That's, that's the message here. Yeah, it's not to just look at the um, Well, you know, if you have a lot of data, if you have 10,000 observations, then histogram of anything that is normal will look like bell. But if you have like, well, let's take a look on histogram once again of this. So is it normal or not? We don't know in result of Shapiro test. Or is this normal or not? So you see, if you don't have uh, enough samples, a histogram can be a little bit confusing uh, or may not be sufficient to, to estimate normality of the data. OK, so three ways of doing student's t-test. So here comes the most favorite test of, of uh, all. So let's do the test. Uh, we will test association between mileage and uh, and transmission. So one way how to do it is so t test in essence is comparing two samples or two population two. I don't know, two samples, and it basically says whether their mean is different, significantly different or not. So what we need, we need two samples. So one sample will be mileage of cars that have an automatic transmission, and another sample here will be cars that have a manual transmission. And that should be enough to calculate, uh, to execute the t-test. So here we have a mean of first group, mean of second group, and statistical significance saying how likely it is that uh, such a difference will be obtained by chance. So I promise there are three ways. So this is the first way. The second way would be to do that. Is that a negative or a tilt? Okay, it's hard to see. Oh, pardon me. It's a tilt. It's a tilt, right? Oh, okay. I, I don't understand. Well, um, but yeah, tilt. Yeah, it's tilt. So, second way is to do this, which is, I would say, a little bit ugly. And the, probably the most elegant way would to do that. Like, just write a formula and then say which data set you are you have in mind and no matter what you do you always obtain the same results and back to the notion that numbers should be always accompanied by some uh, graphs uh, then i cannot imagine anything better how to support results of the t-test than box plot so it will be Like that. So here are the cars with uh, manual transmission, and they have considerably or apparently uh, greater mileage than those with uh, automatic. Um, selecting the right alternative hypothesis. Well, this can also be confusing, and I hope that I will be able to uh, elucidate it. So when we executed the t-test here, we were testing how likely it is that there will be such a big difference between the, the mileage of these two groups of cars. But we didn't specifically ask whether we are testing whether one will be bigger than another or smaller than the other. We just wanted to know how likely it is that they will be that different. Uh, 
Now, but if we, if our working hypothesis is that cars with uh, automatic transmission have a lower mileage than cars with manual ones, then we should conduct a t-test that has a very specific hypothesis uh, that is testing very specific hypotheses. And this is done like that. So you see the p-value is slightly different now. So I, to prevent confusion, I want to show you something. So. test without telling us is converting this variable into factor. We can do it manually like that. After conversion to factor, zero will be reference and one will be alternative. So, well, not really alternative. I don't know what's the right word for that, but zero will be our reference. And when we, specific, when we specifically say we are testing hypotheses where alternative hypothesis is less, what we are saying is that reference is less than whatever comes after. If we want to test it vice versa, we can either use that. So we say we think it's greater, and now look at the p-value. Or we can relevel the the this factor variable here. Do you think this needs more elucidation, or does it make sense as it is? It is okay. Does that only work for two factors then? Well, t-test is okay. a test that is reserved only for two groups. So it has to be a two-factor uh, variable. I'm not it doesn't actually care that it's a value of zero or what, right? No, it can it's be. Just whichever one if it becomes reference. Yeah. Well, what we can do is uh, do following thing. Uh, it won't tell you much about like what happened, but uh, I'm surprised now. Oh, sorry. I will have to. Um, I will have to change it first to factor and then set the levels. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to waste time with it, but it doesn't really matter what would be the levels of of, uh, uh, of the variable. But you, you actually brought me to a second topic. So what if you don't want to just test two groups, but you have many groups? Like we have cylinders here in, a, in an engine, and we want to test like whether mileage grows or is somehow associated with, uh, with uh, cylinders. Well, there's another very famous test that is reserved for exactly that case, which is called analysis of variance. Although name is a little bit, may, may seem a little bit not intuitive, but it, in, in fact, it is a test. And in R it's implemented uh, in a function A or V, which is shortcut or abbreviation for analysis of variance. So, and it works as far as I remember exactly as a, the interface is very similar to t-test. So we can use and here is the output. Now you may say, oh, hey, where is my p-value? Uh, well, the problem is that I said that most of the test, uh, tests in R will, will give us output uh, h-test object. Well. That implies there are some exceptions, and AOV is one of those exceptions. So class of AOV is something else. But if you want to get to a p-values, you should use summary. And here is our p-value. Now, this is what is called one-way ANOVA. And this is because we only have one factor variable here, which is number of cylinders. If we would like to test number of cylinders and a transmission type and an association of mileage with these two, then you can do, we can do two-way ANOVA exactly as written here. You, look, I used asterisks here instead of like, I multiply the factors instead of 
using plus sign. I could use a plus sign, but uh, we all use plus sign. I know I will be instructed that we believe and we, that two factors do not in, interact anyhow. If if I use this, I allow ANOA to consider option of interaction. And you should always start with that. And only if for some reason you, you have knowledge that allows you to tell that they won't interact, no, by no means, then you should use plus. But uh, generally speaking, you should use always uh, uh, setup that allows interaction. So here is, here is our uh, result. And notice a few things. So again, we have a p-value for cylinders and we have a p-value for uh, transmission. And here is the p-value for their interaction term. Now, um, sometimes you may you may be you may end up in a situation that you don't only need to know that okay the mileage is probably associated with cylinders and, and automatic transmission, but you also want to know what are the differences between given combinations. So is there a statistically significant uh, significant difference between four cylinder car with automatic transmission and two cylinder car with manual transmission? So to do that, you can use something that has a very charming name, and it's called like Tuki's Honest Significance of Significance of Difference. That's the word honest. I don't know, like, I like it very much. <laughs> and uh, as an input for that function, uh, you should use what comes out from ANOVA. And um, I know what's the problem, factors. So you should certainly instruct are that these are factors. Here you go. So what Tuki did for us, Tuki's honest tester, it compared all the contrasts here. It calculated difference between means, uh, confidence intervals, and also generated adjusted p-value. So adjusted means, you know what it means. It's not only p one p-value, it's a test, it's it's adjusted for multiple testing. If we are comparing many, many combinations, chances that we obtain something by chance is growing and adjusting of the p-values is accounting for that fact. I really don't want to go into details with that because this is one topic per se. You can just trust that these p-values are in good p-values now. And here I have a notion or notes and how not to do it. So I'll show you how not to do it. Like once it happened, that I was reviewing a paper and in that paper, they had the results of Tuki's honest, a honest test, but they had they reported no results of ANOVA whatsoever. And it like immediately sparked my interest because, uh, oops, sorry, it's uh, it's kind of rare. And after some interactions, we found out that what they did is exactly this: they took the ANOVA as an input for Tuki, and they didn't did not take a look on ANOVA result at all. They just reported Tuki's results, so post hoc test results. Like, problem is that the fact that some of these p-values here will be significant, some, two, three, four, I don't know, depends, it doesn't really mean that you have really association between, in this case, mileage and cylinders and so on. You have to test it by ANOVA first. If ANOVA is positive, you can apply Tuki. Tuki without ANOVA makes no sense. It's a post hoc test, so again, it will take way, way more time and more effort to explain all the notions and all the details and all the all the aspects of that. But the message is, you have to first report results of ANOVA and then only and only then go to uh, Tuki. It won't, yeah, it won't take much longer though, but really feel free to leave you on. It's, it's okay. Now, so, okay, and what if our variable is not uh, normally distributed? So then you are screwed, but you're not that completely screwed because there are some tests that don't care much about the normality. So I'll show you something. So here, if we take horsepower and we come back to Shapiro tests, you know it because I tried tried before, uh, we obtain like p-value that is very significant. So 
horsepower in our data set is probably not normally distributed. So we want to, if we want to perform pre-tests on horsepower, we, we pretty much can because it's not normally distributed. Well, there are some alternatives. Again, they are not one-to-one -one alternatives, and they have different statistical power. They have slightly different set of assumptions and so on. But plus minus, they will lead us to the same answer. That means how 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 likely it is that we would obtain that difference in a horsepower between manual and automatic transmission. Let's say. So here is the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. Uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov test is is nice alternative to t test if you don't have a normality. Uh, in R, Komogoro Smirnov test has a slightly different uh, interface. So we cannot use this nice, elegant uh, formula. We really have to uh, separate data into two groups. And use it as an input form. Now, this warning here, you don't have to like worry yourself very much. It simply means that there are probably some combinations where, let's say, uh, horsepower of two different cars is the same. Uh, pardon me. They, they have the same. Uh, they, they, in the same group, you have multiple values that are the same. So there are multiple entries with the same uh, horsepower or something like that, or whatever you will be testing. It's these are the ties. It's not. The, it's really not a big deal, unless you have too many of them. So it's also questionable at, at what point, point it becomes a big deal. Uh, alternative to ANOVA, because ANOVA is also assuming normality, would be Kruskal Valley's uh, test. And uh, I have to help myself here because sometimes these tests have a different. Some of them have a kind of weird interfaces, but I believe it should work exactly as with ANOVA. Mm. So, you see, uh, you can again catch the output and go into summary and inspect individual uh, aspects of this test. Now, so this was the hypothesis testing, now comes the uh, regression analysis. So, regression analysis, one thing that I want to stress is in, now a lot of people are like very much into machine learning and this is absolutely okay. I myself am totally into machine learning. But like there is one difference between regression in statistics and regression in machine learning. In machine learning, we use regression as a predictive tool. We train our model on some data and then we want to predict something. In statistics, in statistics, we use regression as an analytic tool. We don't care about training, testing, and predicting. We only care about like whether we can describe relationships between two data, two, two variables, assuming linearity of their association. So it may not seem as a that big difference, but it, it is. And especially like, like now, a lot of most of the students are heavily indoctrinated by like concept of machine learning and when it's come to regression the first thing they want to know are how many training data i need and how many testing data i need but that, that is okay but um, uh, like prior everything they should know something about like what's the intercept and, and, and regression coefficient what is r squared and so on so i'll try to touch to touch some of these things uh, here so, the mathematical basis regression so it's just slow regression the same, like the yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to confuse you by that. It's 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 the absolutely same regression. It's like no, nothing is different. Is the the aim of what we want to obtain is is uh, and yeah, how we interpret the results are slightly different. So, no problem. Uh, let's do a linear model where we take uh, again miles per gallon as a function of uh, horsepower. And uh, so what we obtain is some very, very sparse description of our model, but if we push the output into variable m and we look at the summary, we obtain this. So here's the 
I probably we don't have enough space here to go into details of linear regression, but it simply tells us that that if horsepower is increased by one, then then the mile, miles per gallon will be increased by minus 0 0.06 times one. So this is the regression coefficient. This is the standard error of the regression coefficient. That means that if we will do some bootstrapping on our data set, then regression, and then we will calculate the standard deviation of the obtained regression coefficients, it would be something like that, very close to that. T value is basically regression coefficient in the units of standard error. So how many standard errors from zero we are, so that we need. And this is the P value, which comes from T test. <laughs> So we can conclude, judging by numbers, we see that horsepower is very strongly associated with, with uh, mileage. Now, um, if we store summary into a variable, then we can find a lot of other interesting things about like R squared. I don't know if you know that, that variable or what this measure. It measure says like what fraction of variance var of the of the mileage in our data set we can describe by means of horsepower so up to 60 percent uh, but these are rather statistical nuances and we will focus here on the implementation and execution of these things in r so if we will use instead uh, of numerical vari variable some categorical variable so so uh number of cylinders or let's say uh, transmission type we can create more complex model and we can again review the, the results now notice one thing uh, do you know something about one hot encoding so if we have a categorical variable, let's say it would be nationality, ethnicity, or something in biostatistics or, or epidemiology, you cannot just throw it on the linear model because it's just text, right? You have to encode it by numbers. One way is to do one whole encoding. So you have a three levels, you represent it, represent it by three columns. Each of them is binary. And that way you somehow encode or instruct uh, your linear regression or regression model uh, about these variables and how to deal with them and how to associate it with response. Now, I did something that I didn't want to do uh, is number of cylinders in our data set is like two, num two cylinders, four cylinders, six cylinders. One special type of, of uh, categorical variable is ordinal variable where we can not only have listed these levels, but also order them from two to four, like imagine that you will have uh, some, some data that contain the highest achieved education. It will be high school, university, and PhD. So we cannot really say that PhD is 10 times better than, than, than master degree, although probably it is, <laughs> but we can certainly say this is probably higher than master, and master is higher than, than undergrad. So we can order them. We cannot really quantify the difference, but we can order them. I will do the exactly same thing with the cylinders, although it's kind of a cheating because cylinders can be quantified, but let's imagine them not. So, so I said that if you have categorical variables, you can use one hot encoding. If you have ordered levels, then you can use something that's called polynomial encoding. So the each level will be represented by number one, two, three, depending on the number of levels. And then instead of one column, you will have a one column that is linear, so one to three representing your, your levels. Then you will have a quadratic column that will be one to three squared. So one, four, nine, and you can have a cubic column, but typically the degree of polynomials used is one minus, is number of levels minus one. So you will see. <laughs> so in this case, we have uh, two, and two, four and six uh, cylinders. And uh, that means we will use only linear and uh, quadratic terms. So it will be square, number of cylinders and square of number of cylinders. Um, so it's here. So this is the contribution to linear model from uh, transmission type. This is from uh, 
linear encoding of the cylinder number, quadratic encoding of cylinder number interaction. Uh, sometimes, and it's more often than not, when you are building a research project, you do something like that and maybe not even intentionally, maybe yes, R will take a look, we'll find out that your variables are factors, they're ordered or they are one hood encoded and so on. And it will throw at you these things, linear, quadratic, and, and, and if, if, if uh, transmission would have a three levels, it would have uh, probably not only one transmission, it would be like coefficient associated with each possible level. But for your science, you need to tell one number so how significantly are cylinders associated with response? So you don't need to have two, you want to have one. And this is something that a lot of people are like scratching, a lot of people are scratching their head on, okay, so regression analysis gave me two p-values, one for linear term, one for quadratic, how should I put them together? Does it make sense? Do you know what is the problem here? You are not, okay, so forget about any polynomial encoding at all. Let's go back to this thing. So if I do summary of the model, it reports following regression coefficients. Regression coefficient the intercept, regression coefficient associated with transmission type, and here comes the regression coefficient associated with fictional column that represent where the car has a six cylinders. And there will be another fictional column in our data that says where the car has eight cylinders. Does it make sense now? And for each of these, it will assign one regression coefficient and we will test it by t-test to generate one p-value. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. But you are supposed to go to CTO of your company and say right away one p-value, how significant the number of cylinders is associated with horsepower because like your company needs to buy cars and you need to know what cylinder, how many cylinders they need to have. So how to put these together? Like, so one way how to do it, well, pretty much is the only way how to do it, is to use ANOVA. But this is like a different ANOVA from the one that we use. This is, it's, it's somewhere deep inside. It's the same ANOVA, but implementation is different because this ANOVA is reserved for linear models. So you use linear model as an input for ANOVA, and now notice what's going to happen. Um, so it somehow find a way how to merge p-values of individual regression coefficient together. It does this by analyzing variance of errors of regression. So it will basically compare all the possible models, so regression model without cylinders equal to six, and then model where there is no column for four cylinder cars and so on. And now I'm, I know I'm confusing you simply. It, it does a lot of combination of possible linear models you can get by omitting individual uh, coefficients. And it will just tell you how significant is the contribution of, of uh, uh, individual variables. And now... Pardon me? Yeah. I have a question regarding that. Uh, so when you get an output and there's a linear and a quadratic term, mm -hmm. are they both in the linear model or are they only present one at a time but getting the whole output? Great point. They are both present. They're both, they are both present, yes. So whenever we see this yeah. and they're both there, we always have to follow up with it in order to get that <coughs> one. We can't just simply ignore the quadratic term. Although very, like you will be surprised, many people exactly do that. They report the most, more significant value because it's more significant. That means better science. <laughs> so, so in, then, like in R, I see it, but in SPSS, I think I don't. If I remember. Um, so it just gets like somehow amended. Or what um, I'm I'm positive that. Well, A, if it is not implemented per se, it mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's probably need, you need to catch the residuals of your model and then study residuals against the competing model where this variable is not present at all. And that way you will obtain the significance. So you should see the, the residuals with adding this variable should be smaller than without. And if they are significantly smaller, that p-value tells you exactly how significant your variable is. Uh, I know that um, 
in Python, stat mo stats models, I think it's equipped by function that allows uh, exactly this, this, this type of uh, cold hook analysis. And I'm not sure about uh, scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is, again, this machine learning perspective on logistic regression. So they probably develop functions towards predictability and assessing of generalization errors and so on and so on. And maybe, just maybe, but I really don't know whether they, they uh, pay attention in, in scikit-learn to these things. I, mean, I, I just use R. So always, whenever you see multiple, yes, uh, yes, you have to follow yeah. ANOVA and the report. Yes. So I do report. Do you report the ANOVA and then you put that in a supplement? This is a whole model, but yeah, that will be the. You can report the 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 output from the linear model, and you can say that on the top of that we conducted ANOVA on uh, residuals. Yeah. Sometimes if it's ref referred to as a type one or type two ANOVA, I'm not uh, entirely sure. Uh, I'm sure the reviewer will know anyway. <laughs> and uh, and that, that is the most rig rigid way how to do that, especially in biostatistics and epidemiology. This is very common because you have plentiful of uh, various uh, ordered vari ordinal variables or categorical ones. And now this is really the last, very last thing that if we flip the table and let's say we are trying to predict uh, whether a car has automatic or manual transmission, now again, not predict, we try to uh, associate uh, type of transmission with number of, let's say, cylinders and mileage. So one way how to do it is using logistic regression that is hidden in a general linear model in R, so GLM function, you just have to specify family of link functions and I don't want to bore you with what exactly this is it's just like if you say binomial here it will know that you are looking for logistic regression and you may inspect the, the variables here so that's it from me for today uh, I hope that you like it and uh, if you have any questions you can ask now or you can send me an email later I will clean that script that I just wrote here a little bit, and I will send it to to you, Sarah, or you, to to you, Lina, and then yeah, I think you can ask for it at any time. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.